President, please be seated. The court is Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, good morning, Your Honors, uh, Council, uh, parties. Uh, I'm going to, um, this morning, um, make a few um, points uh, regarding the arguments we've heard from the defense uh, on the uh, Democratic Capuchia Security Offices uh, and the uh, CPK policy on enemies. Um, but let me start um, with just a, a few general observations on what we've, um, what your honors have heard the past seven days. Uh, trials uh, like this uh, ultimately uh, are a truth a seeking process. And you've heard two vastly different uh, accounts of the evidence before you over the last seven days. The contrast couldn't be more stark in our view. In our presentation and the uh, lead co-lawyers, we uh, were very careful to present to you uh, the most powerful evidence from witnesses who testified in this courtroom that we believe proved the crimes and proved the accused's responsibility. From us, you heard testimony from witnesses, civil parties and experts, contemporaneous documents from the regime, statements of the two accused. We said we would focus on the evidence, and that's what we did. Then came Friday, and ignoring the reality of what had taken place for the previous three days, the Nunche defense pulled out a script of talking points and told you, as if you hadn't been here for the past three days, that the prosecution's case was based on out-of-court evidence. And they repeated that untruth over and over and over for two days. I'm sure you are familiar with the old saying about propaganda that if you repeat a lie often enough, people may start believing it. And I can only speak for myself, Your Honors, but for me, it felt like it was raining lies in this courtroom for two days. And after having accused us of relying on out-of-court evidence. We then heard almost half a day uh, on the Nunche version of history, the crocodile, which the International Co Prosecutor has discussed in detail. And when they did bother to identify sources, what were they? Anonymous defectors who spoke to journalists. Anonymous witnesses interviewed by Tet Sambat. Unknown sources from China and East Germany. People who were not even here in this country. Khmer Rouge propaganda and most telling confessions of S-21 prisoners. You heard a story based almost entirely on the most unreliable out-of-court evidence imaginable. The irony was striking. I believe your job has been made easier by what you heard. It's your responsibility to judge the quality and the quantity of the evidence you've heard, and I think you've been given a very clear choice. Now let me turn to some of the specific issues that we heard from the defense. On the uh, CPK's, what they called security policy, 
they argued to you that the policy uh, the CPK only considered as enemies those who engaged in dangerous activity that was a threat to the regime. Your Honours, their only support for that is Article 10 of the DK Constitution, a phony document that the accused helped draft to create a facade, a facade of fake elections, a legislative body that never passed a single law, courts that didn't exist, um, judges who were never appointed. It was not reality. It was DK propaganda. You saw the truth uh, in the minutes from the 8 March 1976 Standing Committee meeting, where we saw what the CPK leaders really thought about the fake government institutions they had created. Remember those words. Uh, from those minutes, and this is document E3-232. I quote, do not let it be seen that we want to suppress. Do not speak playfully about the assembly in front of the people to let them see that we are deceptive and our assembly is worthless. You heard in this court from two of the representatives uh, who were publicly announced as members of Noon Chea's worthless uh, representative assembly, uh, Prakut and Ung Ren, uh, that the assembly never convened to enact any law. On torture, the defense told you that the party had clear rules on interrogations, and then most amazingly, they tried to argue to you that torture, the word torture, doesn't really mean torture. Who was peddling narratives in this courtroom? This was an Orwellian narrative. Black is white, two plus two is five. Torture is not really torture. Tell that to Chum May whose toenails were ripped from his feet and his finger broken as he tried to defend himself from repeated strikes with sticks. Tell it to Bu Meng, who was electrified near his genitals. We don't have to guess, Your Honors, about what the word torture meant in democratic Kampuchea, because we heard testimony from the chairman of S21 and the interrogators admitting the methods of torture that were used. And those specific methods of torture are recorded in the S21 documents, beatings with sticks, electric shocks, suffocation by plastic bags, water torture. Let me turn to Cranked Chan. I'm not going to be able, obviously, in the time, and we do want to finish, <laughs> Your Honors. It has been a long trial uh, and a long uh, nine days, eight days. Uh, but I would like um, to focus uh, in some specif specificity about Krang to Chan to respond to the arguments, uh, and then I will also make some observations on the other sites. Uh, in the submissions you heard on Krang to Chan, Your Honor, the defense got almost nothing right. Uh, from the very outset, when they told you that Mia Soka was a civil party uh, who provided unsworn evidence. Uh, as you heard from uh, Marie Gouraud yesterday, that is simply wrong. And they told you that Krang Tachan survivor Born Saroon was released after a week and never mistreated. And your honors, uh, I'd like to play you a video clip so you can see the defense's example of a prisoner in democratic Kampuchea 
who was treated well. If we could play video clip one, please. I was given a letter of gruel and so was my child. I didn't want to eat the gruel but I gave it to my child and I waved. Then they saw me weeping and uh, they came in to beat me up. And my child was beaten too. I had to starve myself so that the food uh, was given to my child. Your Honor, Your Honor, Vorn Saroon's husband was killed at Krangchan, her baby beaten in front of her. She was not released after a week, as the defense told you. She was imprisoned at Krangchan until the very last day, over a year and a half, performing hard labor a caring earth that resulted in injuries she still suffers from today. When her interrogation finished, she was told that she would work hard until her death. She testified her life was only spared quote, because they needed to enslave us in order to provide them with the service within the compound. And why did Vorn Saroon have to endure this? Had she uh, or her one-year-old baby engaged in dangerous activity that was a threat to the regime? Of course not. She was arrested because of who she was married to and because some co-worker had named her uh, when he was tortured and provided a confession. And I should remind you that Vorn Saroon was a witness called at the request of the defense. You also heard the Nunche defense argue uh, that you should ignore the surviving records from Tramcock and Crank to Chan because they are photocopies, an argument you have rightfully rejected before um, as contrary to the law of any modern court. And they told you that the records uh, were not authentic and that, uh, and I quote counsel here, the co-prosecutors did not even bother to try to establish the authenticity of any of the Tramcock district records they use, end of quote. And I wonder what trial they were watching. Your honors may remember uh, these are some of the uh, notebooks uh, of interrogators that survived. Uh, they're very distinct. They were students' notebooks. And you heard in this courtroom from Shreitan Little Doik, uh, who uh, authenticated these documents and told you he saw the interrogators using these books while he was in the room with them. Uh, he was responsible for typing up reports. This, Your Honors, uh, is the monthly prison report for November 1977. Uh, Sreitan testified it was written by Big Doik, uh, the member of the Krang Tachan Prison Committee. The next document. Next slide, Sreitan uh, and Petch Chim uh, also authenticated the documents that were written and signed by the prison chief on, including interrogation reports uh, like the one you see now, uh, which contain execution orders uh, on the document. They identified on's signature and there are documents uh, also that are in, entirely in his handwriting. And the next uh, slide uh, is another important document, also authenticated by the person whose name appears in it. This is uh, the report from uh, Cheng Torn, Commune Chief Kong Bun. Uh, she testified here uh, on the 4th of May 
2015. This report was written for her by one of the staff in her commune office. She confirmed uh, that she received uh, from the district uh, the instruction that you see uh, in the document. Uh, she testified that she received this instruction to purge law no officers as recorded in this letter. And of course, your honors uh, will recall, of course, uh, former District Secretary Tassan, uh, who wrote this letter uh, ordering the killing of young children. Uh, Tassan admitted this was his writing Tassan and his signature uh, in this extremely important document. Uh, these are just a few examples, your honors. Examples, uh, the names of officials that you see in the Tram Tramcock records uh, have been confirmed by the testimony of witnesses. These, these are real people. The names you see in these records match the testimony about who was in charge during this regime. And, and that is just a small sampling. We used documents, we tried to use documents with every single witness who appeared in this segment. There, there is no doubt about the authenticity of these records, uh, Your Honours. On torture at Krangtachan, the defense uh, asked you I would submit to ignore the evidence. Ignore the prisoners and cadres who worked near the interrogation hut, saw the instruments of torture in that hut, and heard the screams of the prisoners while they were being interrogated. They want you to ignore the documentary evidence confirming the use of hot methods of interrogation. And they told you uh, yet another uh, falsehood that our case here is based on out-of-court witnesses and the guards who testified uh, contradicted Soy Sen, uh, and I quote the defense again, uh, they, they told you that uh, those guards undermined some so-called accepted truths of the Manichaean narrative, such as the use of plastic bags to suffocate detainees. Uh, this method of torture, Your Honours, suffocation with plastic bags, that we remind you this was a method that was taught by Born Vet, a zone leader then and uh, who would become a member of the CPK standing committee. He instructed Doik that if the vein in a prisoner's neck was vibrating strong while they were being suffocated, they should be considered spies. This was a method of torture used at S21, admitted by the prison chief, and expressly referenced in the surviving documents. It is not a narrative. With respect to Krang Tachan, the same method of torture uh, was witnessed by Mia Soka, confirmed by Sai Sen, and, and admitted by two of the prison guards. Mia Soka, Your Honours, was credible. He did not overstate uh, what he saw or knew. He described one occasion in which he was working near the interrogation hut and saw a prisoner uh, being suffocated with a plastic bag, a prisoner who died the very next day. Soi Sen cleaned inside the interrogation hut and he saw the plastic sheets there. And guard So Tsang described at three separate points of his examination over two days in this court how, when he was at the guard's kitchen, he personally witnessed a prisoner beaten with a club and suffocated with a plastic bag. And this is an important part. How far is it from the guard's kitchen to the interrogation hut? Let me show you. 
This is the OCIJ map or diagram of Krang to Chen. And if we click, uh, you can see the interrogation house and the guards' dining hall are down uh, in the bottom right corner. Uh, if we could click on that, there we go. Uh, Your Honors, um, if you look at the uh, distance indications on this map, uh, the guards' kitchen, where Satsang witnessed this, and the interrogation hut are less than 10 meters apart. Contrary to what you heard from the defense, the defense, Vorn Sroon did not just hear the sounds of a prisoner being be beaten and screaming during his interrogation while she was working in that area. She also saw the results of the torture when two of her fellow prisoners returned to their cells with wounds after their interrogation. And on executions at Krang to Chan, the defense uh, tried to argue a reasonable doubt as to whether there were any executions at Krang to Chan by attacking the credibility of Miyasoka and Soi Sen, a witness and civil party whose testimonies were credible, and I would remind you they were corroborated over and over by the guards and other witnesses you heard from. That is not to say there are not some issues on which there are different recollections. That is always the case. But when you look at the evidence, as we have put it together for you in our brief, the accounts from the people at Krang Tachan, guards and prisoners, is virtually the same on every issue. In making this argument to you, uh, Your Honors, the defense uh, simply ignore the admissions of the guards that virtually every prisoner sent to Krang Tachan was executed and only a handful survived. They ignore the testimony of their witness, Lauren Saroon, who witnessed the guards taking prisoners out and returning covered in blood. And they uh, especially ignore the authenticated execution orders that came down from the sector secretary and the authenticated monthly report that I just showed you a few minutes ago, recording that 92 prisoners were killed in the month uh, of November 1977. There was a similar report for July 1977 recording that 39 prisoners were killed that month. And if you look at both of those monthly reports, you'll see that the number of prisoners entering each of those months was even less than the number killed. In other words, these documents show there was a constant flow of prisoners in and constant executions on a monthly basis of a large number of people. You cannot create reasonable doubt, Your Honors, simply by burying your head in the sand and ignoring the evidence that has been presented against you. Okansang. Okansang. And of course, the key issue at Okansang, um, La uh, bien sûr, à Okansang we all agree on, uh, was the execution of the large group of Jirai uh, prisoners. And we would submit the arguments you heard from Defense Council, uh, again, do not accord with the evidence. First, they told you it was mere speculation these dry were killed because no one witnessed the killings. Your Honours, most murders are proved without any eyewitness of the actual killing. And what they ignored entirely in their argument was the admissions of the Okansang prison chief and deputy made both in this courtroom uh, and in their OCIJ interviews 
that they received orders to execute this large group of Jurai from the Division 801 Secretary and admissions that the order was carried out. It should go without saying that admissions of serious mass killings like this, they're not given lightly or often by perpetrators who are involved in such atrocities. You also heard uh, from some of the detainees uh, who saw, not only saw this large group of dry brought into the prison, but a few days later taken out, uh, and they described for you uh, how they found uh, mass graves in the B-52 craters uh, next to the prison um, with the distinct dry clothing scattered around. The defense also told you that the witnesses only spoke vaguely about uh, the people who were killed. Again, not true. The most knowledgeable witnesses, the prison chief and deputy, uh, they both said that the number of dry was, quote, more than, more than 100. A Pantol, one of the surviving detainees you heard, uh, could not provide an exact figure, uh, but testified there were truckloads, that there were so many, some had to sit outside the cells and be watched by the guards all night. One of the survivors interviewed by OCIJ uh, who passed away before uh, he could appear here, uh, put the number of dry as high as 250. And your honors, uh, I think we've all seen in this courtroom um, that when it comes to estimating large groups of people who start to get over 100, uh, estimates are going to vary. Uh, people are not sitting there with counters uh, to make exact accounts of the numbers. What is absolutely clear from all the testimony is this was a very large group of people. It was killing on a massive scale. Make no mistake. And one of the key issues raised uh, by the defense was whether the large group of Jirai uh, who were killed at Okansang, uh, who we heard about from the witnesses there, uh, was the same group of Jirai uh, who were reported to the center in the 15 June 1977 telegram uh, that you've seen uh, many times, putting it on the screen just to remind you. This is document E3 slash 240. And we would submit, Your Honors, that it is rather unlikely, rather unlikely there were two separate occasions on which Division 801 captured a large group of Jirai uh, that included men and women traveling from Vietnam. But even if the defense were right, even if this telegram involved a separate occasion, all that would mean is that there were more than one, more than one time that Division 801 captured and took into detention large groups of Jirai, that there was not just one massacre of hundreds of dry, but perhaps two. This argument doesn't help the defense at all. We believe, though, uh, that it is clear that the group of dry who were described in this telegram, who were taken to Okansang and killed, uh, are the same uh, dry. Uh, the dry taken to Okansang are the same as described in the telegram. And this telegram. Um, you will note, was written when the Jirai were first captured. It talks about uh, initial questioning, but proposes uh, measures regarding further interrogation. And it seeks instructions from the leaders in Phnom Penh as to what to do with the Jirai. So this telegram is early on, after, immediately after the capture. 
One of the issues raised by the defense is how could it be the same group um, uh, if, if the executions described didn't take place until later, later on? Well, first of all, when they tell you that the witnesses are in complete agreement, as they did, that the executions at Oak and Sang were not until 1978, 